So again, thank you all for joining us here uh, this afternoon for our webinar on continuous improvement planning and developing a, uh, an effective improvement plan. Uh, my name is Ruth Swanson and I'm the program manager for District 180. And with me today from our branch is Marsha Van Hook, who is an educational program consultant. We are also lucky enough to have um, several consultants from across the um, the department who are responsible for some of the content in um, the different diagnostics. And so we have a great opportunity for um, you to hear directly from them about the specific diagnostics that they work with and have the opportunity to ask them any questions that you may have. So I'm going to ask real quick um, and I'll just ask one of my presenters to let me know for sure. Are you seeing the PowerPoint on the screen? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you so much. Didn't want to keep going forward if we weren't seeing what we needed to. So by the time you are done with the webinar today, here's what we hope you leave with. First of all, we want you to have an understanding of the planning process, and we're mainly going to talk about it through the lens of compliance today. Um, you will hear definitely about the systems and the processes of continuous improvement, but a lot of the focus is going to be on the specific diagnostics and um, the compliance aspects of that. We also will talk about a few changes that have been made to the timeline um, and the, the diagnostics that occur in each of the phases of that timeline. We're going to spend quite a bit of time uh, looking at how the needs assessment really informs your continuous improvement planning. Um, we have one of our continuous, and coach, uh, continuous improvement coaches with us today who's going to share a process that really deepens that needs assessment process. And so it'll be a great opportunity to learn about that. We'll definitely talk about the required components with the CDIP and the CSIP and talk about the different diagnostics in there. And then Marsha is going to share just some tips and tricks for really navigating the continuous improvement platform, what used to be called EPROVE. Most people still call it EPROVE, but just some tips and tricks for getting around in that system itself. So I like to start off with um, just referencing the regulation that our improvement planning process is driven by. So 703 KAR 5225 really establishes that continuous improvement planning process for both districts and schools. In that regulation, it does outline the key components of the plan, and part of that is the definitions. And so the regulation actually defines the CDIP as a plan that's developed with input from parents, staff, and representatives from school councils. And then the CSIP is defined as a plan that's developed by the school council with input from parents and staff. So you can see from the beginning, from the regulation itself, the importance of this being a collaborative process and not one in just in where, you know, someone goes in their office, shuts the door, excuse me, and cranks it out. So the, the importance of collaboration really starts from the regulation and moves forward. Other things to know about um, the regulation itself, our timeline is actually set in there. So that's how we get our October 1 deadline or November 1 deadlines and so on. And then also within the regulation, it does talk about the posting requirements that the CDIP be posted on the district's website. And that's all the pieces of it. And then the CSIP is posted to the uh, school's website as well. So those are set forth in that regulation. Now, in terms of the planning requirements, it's really our job at KDE to monitor for compliance with both federal and state uh, requirements. And so we do that in a couple of different ways. Several or all of you actually this year should have gotten an email from us after that October 1 deadline for phase one. Um, stating which diagnostics were complete and any diagnostics that may not have been completed yet. So that's one way that we do monitoring. Another way is we actually do review a percentage of CDIPs and CSIPs from across the state with a rubric. And as we review that and score it on that rubric, we'll provide districts and schools with feedback 
letting them know if there are some areas that don't quite meet expectations for submission. We'll give you some guidance on that and ask you to revise and um, repost, re-upload those pieces of your CDIP or CSIP. We do, um, we are just in the uh, final stages of finishing up our rubric for this year. We will post that on the continuous improvement or the comprehensive improvement planning web page. So if that rubric is something of interest to you, look for that coming here in the next couple of weeks. From there then, it's really the district and the school's role to monitor and support the implementation and the progress of that plan. And so what that ent entails really is First of all, a commitment to some of those essential processes that really have to go on before you actually start putting responses on that diagnostic. So we're talking about things like really developing a clear direction, um, engaging the folks who are going to be actually doing the work, and then really using a true process for continuous improvement. So really making a commitment to that creates a plan then that is really your roadmap and it can um, inform the daily work if it's done well and done right. And so that way it's not just a check it off, mark the box, move on to the next thing, but it is really your guide for the year and the work that you're doing in the district or the school. With that then, um, you want to make sure as the district or the school that you're monitoring the implementation and in fact the um, effectiveness of your CDIP and CSIP. We always want to talk about, yes, we know there are deadlines. There are certain deadlines by which each of these diagnostics need to be completed and submitted, but you are um, definitely allowed and even encouraged to go in and make any revisions that you might need to throughout the year as things come up. If you're seeing something's not working, changing something out. If you're seeing something's working well and you wanna add a little bit more to it, you can always do that as well. So think of it as a living document, something that you really do wanna have guide your daily work and it is okay and even encouraged to go in and make revisions as those are needed. You may have noticed if you have gotten to the continuous improvement platform from the Cognia homepage that there are now two login options at the top of that page. The first one, if you are simply wanting to access diagnostics, open new ones, complete them, submit them, then you want to choose the login option that says access my journey. That will take you to either the district uh, dashboard or the school dashboard. There is a second one that's available to you that says new login. Cognia has created a new platform for professional learning. And within this platform, there are modules that um, talk about different content, different topics related to school improvement. And all schools and districts have access to this new professional learning platform. And I do encourage you, if that's something of interest to you, your district or your school, sorry about that, to go ahead and check that out. But just know that if you click that new login, it will ask you to create a new user word, username and password. It will not have any effect on the username and password that you use for your diagnostics. So they will actually be two separate logins, one for the professional learning platform and one for the continuous improvement platform where those diagnostics are held. Once you get in there, this would be um, the login screen that you would see. But the other thing you'll notice is that from within that professional learning platform, you can actually get to the diagnostics. You'll see that link there to my journey if you were to click on that, it would then take you to the area where the diagnostics are held. So here's the timeline for this year, and I'll just talk briefly about some of the changes in it, and then we'll talk about each of the diagnostics and um, some of the other consultants who are here can share with you maybe some of the reasoning for some of the changes within the timeline. So we just finished phase one uh, a few weeks ago, you completed the continuous improvement diagnostic for both districts and schools. You completed the executive summary for both districts and schools, and that was new for phase one. 
that had been moved up to phase one. And then also new within phase one was the school safety report. We were very intentional in making the move with the school safety report. And um, Doug will talk a little bit more about this probably later, but we found that when the school report and the district report were both due at the same time, districts had difficulty using the information from the school safety reports to inform their district safety report. And so they would in turn set earlier deadlines for their schools and then schools tended to get confused. What is the actual deadline? You know, the diagnostic says November 1st, but my district's telling me I have to have it earlier. So we did go ahead and actually make that change. It made more sense that the school safety report is due first, and then that information can be used to inform the district safety report. Uh, within phase two, then there's nothing new that has moved in there. You have the needs assessment for both districts and schools. You have assurances for both districts and schools, and then you have that district safety report. Within phase three, that's where the, the full plan with your goals, objectives, strategies, and activities are due. And then you also have the superintendent gap assurance. And then phase four has really grown over the last few years. We've added some new diagnostics for districts with the um, English learner plan and the continuation of learning plan over the last few years. And then this year, the professional de development plan for both districts and schools has been moved to phase four. And Renee will talk a little bit about um, why that decision was made to move that to where it is. Phase four has always been about as well progress monitoring. And we'll talk a little bit about how that process is really built into the template for the CSIP and the CDIP. So it's definitely an integrated part of the process. There's just a list of the diagnostics within phase one. I'll talk a little bit about them, but since they're hopefully already completed, we won't go into a lot of detail. One thing I will say about the continuous improvement diagnostic, um, it does include just a list of the timeline and the phases. So it's a great one just to print out, set on your desk or put up on your wall as just a good reminder of which diagnostics are due when. The other thing I will say about this one it seems to be an easy one because it just asks you for a uh, name and date. But the important thing is what it is that you're signing and agreeing to. So it asks you as a principal or as the superintendent that you are committing to implementing a true continuous improvement process with fidelity. And so it's not just a matter of signing it and, and moving on, but really thinking about that commitment and the process that you have within your school or your district um, to, to implement that process with fidelity. The executive summary, um, as I said, has moved into uh, phase one, and so it's a little bit different this year. In the past, you were looking back a little ways at what had already happened, and so this year, what you were asked to do was more of taking a look at, at from the very beginning of the year, where are we right now? It asked you to describe your school and your community. That may have changed over the last few years with COVID and other things that have gone on. There could be some changes in there. So just kind of really taking um, a snapshot of this is who we are right now. And then other parts of it ask you to talk about your school's purpose. It asks you to talk about, you know, the mission and vision. Again, that could have changed over the last few years as we've gone through that pandemic and we've seen things in different ways and through different lenses that could have changed our mission and our vision. And so we wanted an opportunity for you to really kind of think about that, um, asking you to think about any notable achievements over the last three years or a few years. And then um, definitely what are those big rock areas of improvement that as you are starting out at the beginning of the year, you kind of see as those important things moving forward. The one um, difficult piece to this um, because of the change in phases was the question about um, whether you are a CSI or a TSI school. So we know um, that you public Identification did not happen until after the deadline for this, 
but schools and districts did have their data prior to that deadline. And so you probably had a pretty good idea of whether or not you were identified as one of those. But we do understand that you may not have fully thought about what is our procedure going to be for creating that school improvement plan, especially if I'm CSI or TSI, and for really thinking about resource inequities that may be going on and how we're going to address them. So you may have not put anything in there because you weren't publicly identified at the time that you completed it and submitted it, and that was fine. But you do want to go back in and revise that. Now that that's been made public, now that you um, are in the process of kind of creating those plans, so when you feel like you have the information you need to go ahead and complete that question, please remember to go back in and revise that and resubmit it in there. We will take a look at that and consider um, moving that question either to a different diagnostic um, or, or doing something so it's not um, the timeline isn't quite as awkward as it may have been this year. And I will turn it over to Doug, who is going to talk to you about the safety diagnostics. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Doug Roberts, and I have been working with the school diagnostic for two, three years now. I've been with KDE for six years. Um, I don't have a lot of information to share. The um, next slide, Ruth, if you want to move. This is the KRS statute that targets the school safety report. That is, um, had a due date of October 1. I have gone in and sent out some reminders when I've gone through to look to see who has completed it. I guess the one most important note that I want to bring out regarding the school diagnostic is in the past we've had schools complete their questions, but they've completed it under the district dashboard. So it never shows up and it looks like they've got um, they've never completed it or never started it. And when I make correspondence back to them, they say, well, I did that two weeks ago or whatever. And then we find where they've gone under the, the district. So as long as the schools are going in under their school dashboard, there's usually not a problem. Um, these are just the categories. Make sure the creator, the name of the creator of, of the information there is correct. There'll be a date that shows last modified, the date that it was submitted, the status in the blue circle there. There will be a, a, a blue icon with a check mark that I'll see once it's completed and that's both for school and the um, district district again KRS um, you're going to get a copy of the PowerPoint so I won't read through that by any means but that diagnos diagnostic is due November 1st which is next Tuesday hard to believe um, so if you have any questions you know send that information to me um, I don't know of any other important points um, other than the schools going in under the school dashboard and not the district dashboard. But I'm available. Our, our email contacts are at the end of this presentation. Send me an email. Give me a call if you have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Doug. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the phase two diagnostics, which, as he said, that deadline is coming up November 1st, next Tuesday. So within there, you have the needs assessment for both districts and schools, and um, you have the assurances for both schools and districts. That district safety report that can be um, that will utilize the information from the school safety report. You'll see that just the little asterisks that we have next to um, the needs assessment. That's just to remind you and point you to a fairly new template that we've added to the process, the key elements template. Um, when our continuous improvement coach gets on here today, she'll talk about a great process that will really help you dig into some of the things that um, you want to look at to determine what processes, what practices, you know, really need to be your focus. And that's what you're going to end up um, communicating on that key elements template. So just a, a reminder that that is downloaded and completed offline, and then you actually upload it as an attachment to your needs assessment. So the needs assessment starts off with a protocol question. And what this is asking you to do is to kind of talk about your process 
for reviewing and analyzing data and then applying those results. What we tend to see is people talk about their data processes that they use throughout the year. So they'll talk about, you know, our PLCs look at data every week or our, um, you know, Im improvement team gets together once a month and looks at data. But this is specifically asking you about at the beginning of the year, how do you gather all that data from the previous year? Look at the new state assessment data that just came in. Look at any survey information or maybe any committees that had met late spring or during the summer. So what's that process to really gather all of that information at the beginning of the year to really think about what are our priorities for this year? So it's not just talking about what you do during the year, but really that big process of taking stock at the beginning of the year and knowing what the priorities need to be. You'll notice that it does also ask you about who was involved. And again, here's that collaborative nature of the process. What school councils, what other stakeholder groups, um, leadership teams, who all was involved in that? And then where do you, where do you keep that information? Where is that documented? A new question on the needs assessment for this year has to do with the review of the previous plan. The review is not new. That has been in regulation. It does ask you to take a look at last year's plan, but there was never a way for you to um, share that information within the needs assessment. So we went ahead and put a specific question on there and it asks you to just summarize the implementation of last year's plan. How did it go? Did you meet goals? Did you meet objectives? Um, which activities worked? Which strategies worked well? How do you know which activities and strategies did not work? And we really want to make sure that we do something differently. So it's asking you to look at last year's plan. How did that go? And then more importantly, what does that tell you then about this year's plan? How do we use what we learned about from last year's plan to help us inform this year's plan? So that is a new question on there. And then it does ask you to get into specific data points. So we ask you to look for trends. Are there certain grade levels that have been doing um, in, that have been improving over the last couple of years? Are there certain content areas? Are there areas that have been declining over the last couple of years? And it does ask you to use specific data. And then we want you to just kind of talk about here's where we are right now. This is our current state and it does ask you to use specific data. One thing I will mention, and I think it'll come up in another slide. Um, it, it's not just all about the state assessment data. It can be about survey data. It can be about attendance. It can be about behavior. Be careful in saying um, culture has really improved if you don't have any data. What data are you using to say or to show that culture has improved? So we are looking definitely for data in there. Then comes the part where you've looked at all your data. You've gone through your process. What are those three to five big areas that we really want to focus on for this year? That's what priority is. We're not asking for a list of everything. Even though you may feel like you want to improve in every single area, that's, that doesn't make it a priority. So you really want to think about what are those three to five things that we want everybody in the district or everybody in the school to really be focusing their efforts on? What are those areas that we're really looking to do something different in? in order to see that improvement. So that's what we, what we mean by priorities. The other one um, that kind of gets overlooked sometimes is this area of strengths and leverages. We do want you to kind of take a look at where, what, where, what in the district or in the school, where are you doing well? But then from there, think about, so what's going on there in that area that we're doing so well? Let's say that your reading scores have been going up for the last three years. OK, so take a take a look at what have we been doing for reading? Have you had a lot of professional development? Have you um, had specific interventions in an RTI or an MTSS system? Is that what you think is really making a difference for the reading scores? 
So if math isn't going so well, how can you use those processes and those systems to help improve the math scores? So not just looking at, about, yeah, we're doing pretty good in this area, but how does that inform the areas that you're not doing so well in? How can you use that to improve in those areas? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie, who is going to talk to you about a process that will really deepen and um, improve the needs assessment process. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jackie Thompson, and as Ruth said, I'm a continuous improvement coach in the Office of Continuous Improvement and Support. This is my fourth year with the department. And I'm one of a team of five and uh, with our supervisor, Susan Greer. And we come into uh, schools to just do exactly that, help coach through the continuous improvement processes. We uh, help assist schools with their um, CSIP and CDIP development and building. And we also help provide professional learning and resources to help sustain that continuous improvement work. So, um, but getting into the CSIP uh, and CDIP developments, we have, um, a process within our work and that we encourage all schools uh, across the state to embark in is uh, the use of the key core work processes. Um, and the, all of that is in, embedded in your uh, my journey. All of those are uh, on, found on the Kentucky uh, Department of Education website. We have all those resources on the uh, school improvement uh, link uh, on the website so you can access those. But we're going to talk about real briefly. I'm just going to give you a brief description of each one of these, but these are what we're calling, of course, the key core work processes. And these key core work processes are processes and practices and conditions that are within a school or district. Essentially, it's all things that encompass the successful running of a school or district and found within the elements of the key core work processes. Um, so the first one is design and deploy standards. And we know that quality curriculum is surrounded around our academic standards and it's fundamental for each and every student. And this key core work process ensures that the Kentucky statutes uh, and of standards is what is being taught. And while that the continuous review and revision of that work are being met to meet the students needs. Design and deliver instruction. This key core process promotes the instructional programs that are and ensures that they are intentional and of highest quality. Uh, we know that our instructional delivery should be evidence based and include appropriate high yield instructional strategies. So this key core work process um, helps us ensure how, how students will learn it and master those standards. Design and deliver assessment literacy is based on the CASEL work, the classroom assessment for student learning. This key core work process bridges the students understanding to how will we know that they've learned it. And this key core work process supports schools inventory of assessment practices and helps them ensure a balanced assessment system. It also promotes communication and understanding to all stakeholders and how they're involved in and in having everybody on the same page when it comes to assessment and that assessment literacy. We want everyone to understand what assessments we're, we're uh, utilizing and embedding in order for us to know if that data that we're gathering from that is quality. Um, the reviewing and analyzing and applying data key core process, it helps us analyze the systems that are in place for us to review and gain that quality data. And basically it's to do something with those results and that something should be surrounded around closing achievement gaps for kids. And design and deliver, align deliver support services. This key core process helps schools ensure there are appropriate supports in place for students who actually need that. Um, this could be behavior interventions. It could be MTSS supports for academic supports. It could be social emotional supports and differentiation modifications. Uh, and that's just to name a few. We know that all schools have so many uh, support services and processes that they provide. Um, this key core work process gives us that opportunity to inventory that and show how it supports the student uh, learning at that point. 
Then um, establishing and learning culture. That's the last key core process. We kind of number these one through six. Um, this one is um, about the learning environment and the setting and the opportunities that we provide for students to be successful. Uh, we have to meet students individual needs within our schools. So um, this key, this actually identifies the key elements within that key core work process processes that students know that they're safe and their needs will be equitable, equitably met all at the academic level, the social, emotional and physical levels as well. So that is a brief uh, kind of description and definition of each one of the key core work processes. So now what are the key core work process purpose? Well, they're allowed for us to use as a need needs assessment and they're there for us to analyze and evaluate and provide evidence in order to identify our strengths identify the areas that we can leverage and utilize as guidance for that next that next level of improvement but it's also to help us categorize and really prioritize our areas of concern and this process really helps us direct our next steps and closing those achievement gaps where we can be very intentional with building those next steps in, in improving student performance. So here is our process that we encourage and that we coach schools through in, in terms of analyzing these key core work processes. Again, Ruth spoke about the, the links that you'll find on the website as well as on the school improvement uh, areas um, within the KDE website. Um, also, these documents are, are coming to particular areas and what you see on the screen is the st strategic level and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But this process is, is what we coach schools through. We uh, give again in, in this document the, the definition, the brief definition of what the key core process is so that everyone's on the same page and we can refer back to it ongoing as we're going through this process. But in the center of the document, uh, we've provided guiding questions for quality practice. So this gives us a guidepost of how we can identify those strengths, those things that we're doing well, and then those areas of priority for um, the things that we want to move and improve uh, at a greater uh, at a greater look. So our process is just a simple highlighting process. We actually take a green highlighter, a yellow highlighter, and either a red or pink. Most of the time we can't find red highlighters, so we utilize a pink one. But with that being said, we uh, utilize uh, a highlighting process with green, yellow, and and red or pink. And the, the way we define those colors is that if we look at the guiding question and we determine that, hey, that's working well, we're monitoring that well, that's impacting all of our kids in every classroom, we can highlight that particular bulleted question or that guiding question green. And then um, the next level would be if it's kind of spotty, it's we've started that process or we've looked at that particular component, but it is not a systematic piece in place and we really need to have some more conversations about it, you might want to highlight that yellow. If it's strictly not on the radar or not even a priority and something that we might need to really dive into, we would highlight that pink or red. Now, if we have highlighted something that it, green or if we've highlighted something yellow, we have to ensure that in that right hand column that we've established clear, concise evidence that that practice is in place and that we are uh, truly embedded in that process. That if we are saying it's working well, if we're saying it's monitored and impacting all of our kids, uh, then we definitely have to have a strong evidence to support that. If it's yellow, we still have to have evidence to support that, but obviously not as strong of evidence to support that as if we were to highlight it green. So hopefully that process makes sense. It's it's a real simple process. While I want to say that it is a timely process and you want to ensure that you have uh, several stakeholders at the table when doing that so that perspectives are all there, we definitely want to ensure that that's part of that process. But again, uh, it's a fairly simple process that we can determine and really utilize that as a, a way, uh, as a means to identify and prioritize some areas. 
So let's look at a, an example on the design and de deploy standards key core process, which is key core process one. This is the first bulleted question. When we have a lots of people at the table, uh, we want to encourage that again for multiple perspectives, but sometimes uh, multiple perspectives uh, cause us to, to kind of get in the weeds of, of specific uh, components or these particular bullets. So with that being said, a great way to look at this is to kind of deconstruct the wording of each one of those components and really focus on the, the parts that are of focus so that we can in turn uh, get the accurate color coding that we want for this. So in this case, what is the assurance? So assurance would be that keyword there that the current curriculum or the curriculums is valid. Valid being the other keyword there and, and components that support the instruction and assessment paced with accuracy. All of those are examples of that, but ensuring that we have an assurance in place that our current curriculum is valid. So if we um, are kind of wallowing in uh, some areas, we want to ensure that we kind of deconstruct those particular components so that we're all uh, all stakeholders that are at the table helping do this process uh, are on the same page. So in this, we've provided an example for you to look at. Uh, this particular school um, would have uh, highlighted this yellow. So in that sense, we're saying that our curriculum is kind of is there and it, in place and it is an actual valid curriculum, but we may not have revised it for a couple years or um, it needs uh, needs some added revisions. It might need uh, some added looks in terms of the assessments. We might have not looked at our pacing guides uh, for a couple of years, and we know that those pacing guides that we have in place right now aren't as current or up to date as we that as we know they should be. So in this case, that would be why this particular one is yellow, and that's just some examples. But remember, we said that if it is yellow, we have to ensure that we've got evidence to support that practice. So in this case, uh, for the CDIP, the example of evidence for that to be yellow would be that district-wide continuous improvement process of curriculum review. And that's just sort of a compliance piece within the policy that allows us to look at the curriculum each year, but we might not do uh, all with it that we should at that particular time and place. Or for the school level, it would be maybe the site-based policy that we go through and identify some weaknesses and strengths within the curriculum, but we haven't really do dove into the um, um, kind of the, I guess the revisions that we need to really focus on in in this in this respect. So, so this is an example of what that would look like and what the evidence would look like if we're utilizing that as a yellow color. So you get an example of the process and you would continue down the list there one through seven and do the same thing. Uh, one other uh, thing that I want to encourage and that we've had to encourage there may be components in each one of these um, uh, each one of these bullets that there may be some that we might see as spotty, but then there are some areas that are pretty solid. So sometimes we get the question, can we color code some of it green and some of it yellow? The answer is yes. When we do have some pieces in place that are monitored well, but we are have some areas of that component that are spotty, Sometimes we have to color code uh, an area within that, or we might have something that's spotty and then another component that's not even on the radar. So we might do yellow and pink uh, in, in one particular bulleted area. If that's the case, again, that's another area. Those are sometimes your quicker fixes because we can identify those areas that we have started and maybe those areas that we haven't uh, put on our radar yet and, and provide the mechanisms in our continuous improvement plan to move that forward. So uh, just a couple of uh, recommendations and a couple of examples here for you to see how, how the process works. So if we are um, developing uh, a way to strengthen that particular process. If we've color coded it yellow or pink, we do uh, 
and we've provided some evidence that is there to show that we do have that in place, but it, it's still very spotty or gapped, if you will. Uh, what are some things that we uh, can utilize or what resources can we use to support that moving forward of that particular component? Um, so uh, this this column has been added just recently to add those resources on how can we look at this uh, in the long term and in the short term as well uh, on how to improve this process or this practice or address this particular condition. And in this case, the example that we just provided would be to embed that the uh, model curriculum framework and as our curriculum development process and, and put that and embed that as a system and with that and put that into our policies, whether it be our district policy or our school policy, and that strengthens and that becomes an ongoing process that uh, again strengthens that curriculum uh, validity and of course the system in, in revising that curriculum and pacing information. So that's a great resource as well. So an, an additional template that we are going to uh, address is the key elements template. And I'm gonna turn this over to Marsha uh, for that. So thank you all for having me and listening. Thanks, Jackie. And thank you so much. You set the stage beautifully for the next portion. And I'm gonna try really hard to tie some pieces that you've already heard from Ruth and from Jackie and something that Doug mentioned that is super important and kind of embed the next part with some tips and tricks to help you in your planning. So when you go back into the diagnostic, this screenshot actually comes from Cognia. Jackie did a beautiful job of walking us through exactly how to dig deep and start to determine what is it that we need to work on? What is it that we need to do? And so you will see highlighted in red here is where you actually reach the key elements template. Jackie walked you through the pre-work and on the next slide, I'll we'll see exactly what that looks like. So there's a screenshot of each of those key elements um, and Jackie did walk through several of these and then your evidence. So this is really where you are evaluating your teaching and learning environment. So consider all of that work that Jackie just walked through and that you have done as a group. What is it that is a process or a practice or a condition? What evidence do I have to support this is working well? This is something we need to do differently. Um, whatever your work has determined. When you go ahead, Ruth, you can go to the next one. When I was going to I was going to break in real quick, Marcia, sure. since I think the next one, it, it moves to assurances. So we've done quite a bit of information so far, gone through phase one, gone through phase two, looked at that needs assessment process a little bit. I just want to stop real quick and see if there are any questions before we continue on. And hearing none, I think you're good to go. <laughs> good. I'm going to I'm going to repeat a tip you've already heard, but please write this one down. Um, if you'll note on the screen, you see the assurances for 2223, and on the left you will see the assurances for schools, and on the right we've highlighted the word districts. Make sure that if you are a school that you are completing the diagnostics on the school side of things. If you are a district that you have selected systems and then found your district. We actually have a screenshot of that towards the end of this presentation when we give you some resources. There is also a SIP, it's CIP user manual with screenshots and actually walks you through how to determine that. Um, I'll say this now, if any of you were at the summit, you heard me say this, it breaks my heart when I get these calls. Um, Doug mentioned he gets them too, but I completed that two weeks ago and you've gotten a status email from us saying that it isn't completed. If you have completed that or someone there in your district has completed on the wrong template, it will not show that you have completed the template correctly uh, on the school side. I'll just use that example. Um, so just make sure that you really have picked the right side. We get a lot of questions around question 31 of the assurances. So when you get to question 31, and specifically when we were in phase one, and I know we're out of phase one, 
but you will answer for the current school year. The verbiage is a little, um, I think we're gonna address that for next year moving forward, but just answer this for the current school year 22-23. If you've already started the plan, say yes. If you have not started the plan, you can say no. You can just return and revise your answer after your plan is made. Just think about that one for this year. So let me walk you through the phase three diagnostics um, beginning November the 1st, which is very, very soon through January 1, districts do need to complete their CDIP and the superintendent gap assurance, and schools will need to complete their CSIP. So again, that little tip, make sure you're in the right place. CSIPs and CDIPs are developed as a three to five year plan. So that process is about reevaluating your needs and your strategies each year to determine if something is warranted. So I, I made a note while Jackie was talking and she explained it beautifully with her color coding. Think about what is working really, really well. What has given you the results that you need? So if you look at, is there something practice, uh, a process in place that is not working at all and we're not getting anything from it, it's not helping us meet a priority, then it might be time to abandon that practice. You might have something in place that a oh, little tweaking is going to really give us the, the leverage that we need. That's something you're going to want to adapt. Or if you have a need, um, you have something and you have nothing to meet that need, it's time to adopt something. So just remember those three A's that will kind of guide you through that. So let me walk you through the 22-23 planning template, and I'll start with CDIP. There has been a change with the indicators, and so now the indicators match our new accountability system. So on the left-hand side, I'll walk you through the seven required district goals. And this was updated, as you can see, by the red circle in May of 22. So the seven required goals are, you will need your state assessment results in reading and math. You will need your state assessment results in science, social studies, and writing an achievement gap, English learner progress, quality of school climate and safety, post-secondary readiness and graduation rate. So those are district pieces. For elementary and middle schools, you are required to have goals for five of those pieces. So they're the same, except you do not have the graduation rate and you don't have the post-secondary readiness. So you have your state results in reading and math, you have your state results in science, social studies and writing, your achievement gap, your English learner progress, your quality of school climate and safety, and then the additional considerations for ATSI, TSI and CSI schools. There, there's a section we'll walk through that a little bit. The schools operating a Title I school-wide program, this plan meets that. So you do not have to have a separate school-wide program for Title I. This plan will meet that school-wide program plan. For high schools, the seven required goals are the same as the district goals. You will see you have your results in your state assessment results in reading and math. You have your state assessment results in science and social studies and writing. You have your achievement gap, your English learner progress, quality of school climate and safety, your post-secondary readiness and your graduation rate. And again, you will have those additional considerations for TSI, ATSI and CSI schools. And the plan will also operate as your Title I school-wide plan. So there's no separate plan any longer. This is one of my favorite sheets. Again, if you're with the summit, you heard me say this. For the purposes of our presentation today, it's in all black. When you get into the template, this page will, will be all red. So I use that just as a visual reference that if you're kind of lost as you go through here, because there's a lot of information for each section of your CDIP or CSIP, go find that red page and, and look back through your notes and see what's listed. So schools for the goals should determine their long range goals. So again, those are three to five year targets for your goal and you'll need that for each school level indicator. And those targets are going to be informed from that needs assessment. So Ruth talked about the needs assessment earlier and how you review your current plan, how you look back, you look forward. Jackie walked us through how you start really digging into those key core work processes and really look at what's working, what's not working. And now it's time to take all of that information and bundle it up into a plan that you're going to use as a living document moving forward.
So we'll start out with goals and objectives. So your goal statements, as I've mentioned, are your three to five year targets, and they are required for each school indicator. I'm going to repeat that a few times, and that goes up at the top. That is your goal. So I'm actually going to walk you through what the template looks like. Your objective, which is under there, is your short term goal, and it is attainable by the end of the current year. So Ruth did mention we do have a rubric that's being revised. That is one thing that we're looking for. Is your goal a three to five year target? And is your objective for this current school year? And I'm, we'll go to the next slide. So here's an example of what that might look like. So your goal statement would read by May of 2026, 75% of all students will be proficient in reading. So your objective under that goal would read the percentage of students scoring proficient distinguished in the all students group will increase from 33.3% in 2022 to 50% by May 2023. So notice how that goal is not, I'm not going to get there from 33 to 75 in one year. How am I going to stretch that out so that it does stretch the, the it does stretch us as a, as a school? But it is attainable. We can make that mark, and then the following year we can work from that 50 and moving forward. So your strategy is your next piece. How are you going to meet that objective? So again, tying back to Jackie walked us through that, what key core work process is an issue for your district or your school? What have you planned systemically? Think again, do we need to adopt? Do we need to adapt? Do we need to abandon something? What is it that we need to put in place a process or practice to help us? And you can have multiple strategies for each objective statement. And you can see in the template um, the screenshot here, we have one objective and there's lines for three strategies. So you might need two, you might only need one, you might need four, but you can certainly get more than one. And what will be done differently than what you've been doing in the past? What are you going to do differently? So the next part is your strategy example. You connect that back to a key core work process. So one of the things that we see often is it will just say listed um, KCWP1. And so I, we don't know what your strategy is under there. You may know, but remember, this is a document that other users will be reading. So make sure you have listed what is it that you're doing and connect that verbiage to the strategy so the example you see that there is curriculum the core work process one and then what's being done underneath that me the next part of the activities and again activities are actionable steps what's the school actually going to deploy to make this strategy come to life and I often think about what is the staff going to be doing differently to improve the outcomes. So if you think about our walked in classrooms, this is what I've seen and now we want to implement this. I often think of it in terms of what action am I going to see either in a classroom or a PLC or in an, an over um, arching process that we have in place at the school. What is it differently and what is it that we are going to be doing that has some action? And then here's some activity examples. So like I said earlier, um, there can be one, more than one activity per strategy that just have to be very clear. So you see the activities. Um, the first example is determine if learning targets and success criteria are clear to teachers. And so you can see the work under there. Um, it's very clear, review and conduct cyclical curriculum checks within the PLC. So those are very specific action pieces that the school is going to undertake. And then your measure of success. How are you going to measure this is being done? So these measures can be quantitative or qualitative. So if I'm looking in my PLC or if I'm using the one, the cyclical checks, how am I going to measure the success that that is being done? What am I going to say that has the impact of that activity? And then this is different. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to look at the uh, examples. I rushed ahead, Ruth, sorry. <laughs> the observable actions. Again, there can be more than one success measure. So if you see the example, ensure congruency is present between the standards, the learning targets, and the assessment measure, measures. Do we have alignment protocols that are completed for each unit? That's something that we can see. Are we, it's an action piece that we can actually look at. PLC notes summarize alignment process for each unit. So there's 
things that we can actually determine and to see, and it's going to be different from our next slide, which is progress monitoring. And this is one of my favorites. So when you think about progress monitoring, we have this plan in place. What is my timeline to measure what is going on? Who's actually doing the monitoring and when is that occurring? So it should not all fall on the principal's shoulders to be the only person or the assistant principal um, that is checking each of these pieces. This should be a representation of your staff, of your leadership team, who's going to lead which part and make sure that this is being done. And it shouldn't be limited just to student data. So think about who are we utilizing in the building to make sure this plan is living, thriving, and that we are actually seeing some results and that implementation is occurring. One thing I do wanna mention here, um, we have seen links. Please, here's another tip. You can put it in your tip section of your notes. Please do not put a link here. We actually have to have a document. We can't open those links. Um, and then again, there's other users that are reading these documents. So make sure you have that clearly delineated of who's doing what, when, and it should be spread out over the course of the year. So here's an example, and this is very descriptive. And so when you think about the things that I just talked about, who, when, um, how often, and what next steps, you can see that the admin team and instructional coach will participate in the PLC meetings to observe the implementation of the strategies learned through the PLC at Work PD. So there's monthly consultation visits here. Um, you can see that there's also a debriefing with the principal and instructional coach on next steps to work in the coming month. So you can see how this work evolves and to measure the progress of that implementation and the plan that they have in place. And then funding. On the very last column of your CDIP or CSIP, there's a place for funding. So you, we just ask that you list the specific funding source, whether it's local, state, or federal monies. So if you're using Title I funds, and again, this is serving as your Title I Part A school-wide plan, you must indicate in this column if, it, if you're using Title I funds. So the next example on the next slide, you can see that a funding source, they've used ESSER funds in the amount of $50,000. Or the other strategy was it was just something that they were doing in the building, um, just the previous example, like monitoring the PLC, that's not costing additional do dollars. That would be an NA. If they're using SIP funds, what amount is that? Um, and again, here's an example for Title I, they've used 4,200. So just make sure for each of those, you have designated some funding source. And if there is not a funding source, that's something you're able to do without outside resources, just list the NA. So now we're going to move into phase four diagnostics, which Ruth did talk about just a little bit. It's progress monitoring, and we do have some new pieces there. Um, and this, this runs year long. If you'll look at the timeline, you will see that it's January 1st uh, through December 1st. So you can always go back in. One thing I do want to mention, Doug said it, I said a little bit about it earlier. You're more than welcome to open any of these diagnostics or all of them. We have seen some districts do that. They've gone ahead and opened them all the way through and then worked on them. As you get to the end date of each of those phases, you just need to make sure that you have that complete and you need to make sure that you've completed it on the appropriate side. Again, if you're a school on the school side, you're a district on the district side, but you can always go back and revise. And that's really a lot of what's coming up in this next section. And so the next piece, and I'm going to turn it over to Renee to let her talk about this professional development plan. But when you're in the diagnostic, this is what you will see. And this is a big change this year. It is your professional development plan for schools for next year, the 23-24. While that diagnostic deals with 23-24, and I'm trying not to steal what she's going to say, you do need to make sure that you have some PD within your step that you have some internal documentation, some internal plan made for professional development for this school year. The diagnostic itself is for the following school year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Renee and let her walk you through this section. 
All right, thank you, Marcia um, and Ruth. I've been admitting people into the meeting, so um, someone else will need to take that over as um, I'm talking. Um, so yeah, so Marcia mentioned about the PD plan diagnostic. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you the changes that have been made in the professional development plan. Um, these changes are the result of Plans that were submitted last year, we did some random reviews of plans from all across Kentucky, as well as input from the professional development coordinators across Kentucky as we work through the revision process um, here at KDE. So the PD plan um, example you see on your screen there is an example of the two priority needs that has not changed. You'll still be developing priority needs based on your school needs assessment. So go on to the next screen. So um, the next slide shows that the plan diagnostic and elements also have not changed. Um, the plans will still need to have a, a mission statement. It'll need to have um, a description of specific people affected by the plan and needs assessment analysis and then your two main goals. Um, but the order of the elements have changed a little bit within the questions of the diagnostic. So the purpose of the PD diagnostic is really to support districts in designing and implementing their plans and aligning to the goals established um, from the KR, KSR on your screen there. Um, and what we um, don't want is that for this to be a compliance document. Instead, we want the questions of the diagnostic to guide planning and professional learning for schools, which using this diagnostic as a tool is why the change was made um, from the earlier phase to um, phase four of the due date. All right, so the diagnostic sections um, and go ahead and click through all of those if you would. Ruth. The diagnostic sections um, with the language um, that's been revised to be more in line with the purpose. And what you will notice is that these areas uh, with the goals um, again have not changed, but we really want districts to focus on more specific specificity in their um, input into the diagnostic. Go ahead. All right, so the red font you see on your screen are the revisions that have been made and the specific questions to consider um, are still based upon your priority needs. Um, the following items there that you see on B and C is really, especially on C, is really to get districts to think more about um, what data they're going to use, who's responsible for the data, not necessarily a person, but just what group of folks are responsible, and then how frequently the data will be an, an, um, analyzed. And we, we really would like for that to be more specific um, for this upcoming year. Go ahead. So you can see the emphasis um, being more specific as you use the, this as a tool. Um, when we reviewed random diagnostics in the past, the information uploaded was often vague. For example, in Part E, many of the review diagnostics from previous years simply just had the teachers would be impacted um, or all staff would be impacted. And we really hope that when you're using this as a tool, when you look at your priority needs, that there will be a little bit more detail put into that planning element. Um, because obviously we are going to have teachers impacted by professional development, but to, to be to meet your need and your priority need um, in an area, we really would like to have that more thought out of and more thought through and thought out as you plan for the following school year. And on F, um, what specific resources are needed? The examples there obviously are. are just some ideas to prompt um, again as the, the people that are filling out the diagnostic to be a little more specific um, in what they want to what they hope to achieve. So finally again the red font shows um, 
more specific details in thinking about ongoing supports. The goal is for you to think beyond a simple entry of uh, we'll work in PLCs or we'll work in de department meetings um, as you de design your plans. Um, and those were um, common answers to um, this prompt um, in the in the past. And you can see just by the, the suggested um, items there in the red font. We are looking for again that um, that more detailed design of your professional development plans. So the changes for 2223 um, again we've changed from um, phase three to phase four and your new upload will be due um, May 1st of 2023 and like Marcia mentioned this will be for the 2324 school year. So those of you that have been used to completing the diagnostic in December um, you will not have that to complete this December. Um, we want you to um, think about all of the, the data that you're going to be collecting in the spring as you plan for the following school year to use this diagnostic more as a planning tool, more of its purpose um, from the beginning. Um, as Marcia mentioned earlier, the plans can be revised after you upload at any time. So if your needs change or professional learning opportunities change, then please as a, go in there and revise your plans. Um, we want it to be a, a working document, a living document, and a document that you will use to help you um, in your planning for the following school year. And the feedback that we received from PD coordinators across the state um, was that this makes more sense um, since we're thinking about um, in May, you're starting to think about summer plans and about getting some professional development lined up for the following school year for your staff. And that's why we wanted to make this change and to make it more relevant for your use um, instead of more instead of a compliance tool to go in and quickly just fill out and complete. Um, so uh, if you have questions about filling, completing your diagnostic, please reach out to me. My email's there. You can call me. Um, that's not a problem at all. Um, I would appreciate hearing input from you as you are working through um, the diagnostic even in May. Um, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have. And I think next we are going to hear from Neil. Thank you, Renee, <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Watts, and I am the branch manager of the English Learners, Migrant, and Neglected Students branch here at KDE. And today I'm going to take a few moments to talk to you about your English Learner plan and your English Learner diagnostic. Um, first of all, all districts are required to develop and maintain an up-to-date EL program plan. This, will, this includes districts with no ELs currently enrolled. Uh, the plan is commonly referred to as the LAO plan, and the plan should be designed to meet the district's obligation to ELs uh, under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and the Equal Educational Opportunities Act. And for the diagnostic, uh, districts will be asked through a series of questions to confirm that the required components and developmental processes have been included in the district's EL plan. Finally, districts will just simply then be asked to upload their EL plan into the continuous improvement platform. Uh, if you have any further questions or uh, want to discuss anything further regarding your English learner plan, you know, please feel free to reach out to me through a call or email, whatever works out for you. All right, I think I'm handing it on to Steve here. Thanks, Neil. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Stephen Kissinger. I've been here at KDE for about six years now, and I've been ahead of the, I've been the NTI guy for about four years or so. So if you're new, you probably haven't talked to me, but winter is on its way, so you probably will talk to me soon. But just talking about um, the plan for the continuation of learning. So it's somewhat interchangeable, continuation of learning and non-traditional instruction. Uh, you can go in right now and start working on your plan. If you want to start calling me and, and working on it together, because I know a lot of people have questions about it where we've reformed it over the last year or so, feel free to do that. Um, it's due on May 1st, but like I said, a lot of districts like to get a ahead of the game on that as well. 
but pretty much the purpose of it comes down to developing your implementation plan for continuation of learning and it's going to have 10 assurances on it your superintendent's agreement for those assurances of what the district has got to do on days that you utilize nti and then you'll have four questions that deal with what your plan on continuation of learning, uh, how you're going to take care of students with IEPs and other needs, and then you've got your special populations in question three, and that is a loaded question. I want everybody to put kind of a star next to that one, because when you're dealing with those groups of people, you know, you've got statutes and regulations that you have to cover, as you can see there, because the main goal is to prevent a loss of learning for all students on those days. And then question four is going to relate everything on the diagnostic back to what they've talked about uh, up to this point, where everything's got to relate to your district goals because for it to be a continuation of learning whatever your district is planning to do you've got to utilize and continue doing that on days you use an nti day uh, next slide please um, i tried to keep this as concise as possible so just the biggest thing that i've ran into and i'm trying to make this as like a help request thing is your nti plan your continuation of learning diagnostic has to be updated every year there's a lot of them that i kind of have to send back sometimes because it's the same and now that we're transitioning out of covid 19 uh, some people utilize or leave language in there that's referencing to covid 19 being current and we're out of school that does need to be updated moving forward uh, remember that your plans are subject to open records requests from the media and such so you need to make sure your district is on top of that when you handle you are signing those assurances of what you're going to be doing so make sure when you're handling the needs of your students that your plan will change from year to year because your students are not going to be the same every year and you're not going to have the same needs when it comes to those days uh, and again i I know it's redundant, but I said all questions must be answered completely and thoroughly, but there are only four questions, but they are loaded questions that when we go in and we monitor and look at what you've been doing on your TI days, it's all got to relate back. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, just kind of a reminder, we are going post COVID now, so when you're planning, remember each district only gets 10 days. So it's health and safety. There's no special COVID days unless something let's hope nothing happens, you know, and legislature has to get involved or anything. You can still reference COVID like lessons your school has taken to go forward and what you've changed. But as for it being the means end all in your plan, probably not the best way to go about that. Uh, next slide. One of the biggest things to help with this when you're setting up your uh, plan is to make sure you go into person role manager every district and then we've sent it out in newsletters and I'm just I'm using this time to kind of use my soapbox a little bit. We need to do this now. You need to update your persons of contact, your active ones for the NTI because I'm going to be especially with winter getting ready to hit. I'm going to be sending out emails and such uh, where we're going to be utilizing these plans you put in last year and working for the next years. Um, so make sure you go in, update whomever is going to be your persons of contact as the active person, and please remove the inactive ones because there's a lot that I still send out for districts and they're retired people and they're no longer there. So we need to be updated. For all other NTI questions or continuation learning plans, there's a link there. I think you all get access to this for the web applications. It goes uh, in there and then the NTI guidance was updated February of this year and anything else my email and contact will be at the end of the slide so just reach out ask for steve kissinger and i'll take care of you and i think we're moving on to marcia i think back to her i think so thanks steve um so i did mention a few of these um a little bit ago the tips and tricks just make sure there's a couple things that are completed offline and then are uploaded into the Continuous Improvement Platform, formerly EPROVE. So your needs assessment key elements, you will find those templates on the uh, for district and school level. They are on the continuous uh, comprehensive improvement planning web page. There's a link to that page at the end of this presentation. And then your goal building templates for both CDIP and CSIP are also located at the bottom of that page. So just make sure that you when you start looking for them, that, that you can find them off-site. So tips and tricks, and I mentioned this, so I just want to walk you through these uh, screenshots of actually, this is actually in the Cognia site. When you are ready to start a diagnostic in any of the phases, and as I mentioned earlier, you are welcome to, to open them all if, if that's something that will help you stay organized, just knowing that you need to work on them and you can always 
make sure that you're meeting the deadlines within the phases and you can always go back and revise them. So if you want to start a new diagnostic, you simply uh, click the new diagnostic button. It is on the right hand top of the menu after you have signed in and you have gone to your institution. So go ahead and select um, at the bottom. It says browse content library. We have circled that in red. You will click the browse content library. And this is super, super important. If you are completing the district diagnostics, select systems. If you are completing school diagnostics, select schools and be sure to answer all of the questions. So if you don't have an answer, you must answer with an NA in the answer space that's provided or that diagnostic will come back as being incomplete. So two things, make sure you're on the correct schools or systems and that you've answered every single question. I do, I wanna say one more thing. Uh, Bruce, can you back, back up for just a second? Um, on that diagnostic, and I alluded to it earlier, we get a lot of calls, but I did it and I look, Ruth will look, um, and it will be, it's been completed on the wrong side. And when I say that a school has completed a district diagnostic, there is no easy button and I, and I wish there were. But if you've done all this work and there's no way to simply transfer that over, over, you will have to open the correct diagnostic and then you'll have to copy and paste each of those answers or do it again from scratch. So just save yourself some agony because it, it just breaks my heart. I wish I could do it for you, but there is no easy way to fix that. You simply have to make sure you're on the right side. Thanks, Ruth. Go ahead. And again, no links to outside documents. Just upload as an attachment. You can spell that stuff out, but you can also upload as attachment to those related documents at the end. And the SIP user manual, it has lots of information. There's snapshots, there's a Q&A, which you might find very, very beneficial. I know I just read that off the screen, but I can't say it enough. We've tried to think ahead of everything that we've been asked and, and we were asked some new questions. And so we expanded that Q&A this year. So make sure you, that you know where that's located. You might wanna park that on your desktop to help guide you through the work. It, we've tried to make it useful for you. And um, for the diagnostic contacts, Ruth, I'll just go ahead here. Uh, the diagnostic contacts you have heard from all of us today with the exception of Natalie. If you need to reach out, here are the continuous improvement coaches. You've heard from Jackie Thompson today. The other coaches are listed there, so you can contact any of those folks to help you out. And then here is your D1A contact information. Ruth Swanson, um, her email is there. Natalie Gushiri is not with us today, but Natalie takes care of CSI schools and evidence-based practices. And then I am Marcia Van Hook, and there is my contact information. If you need any help, just feel free to reach out to us and we'll try to do our best to answer your question. Thank you so much, Marcia. I see that we have a few questions in the chat that I'm gonna cover here before we close out. There are a couple of questions um, regarding um, English learners. And so one question says that if English language learners is not an identified subgroup because of the low number of students in this subgroup, do we need a goal for this on the CSIP or CDIP? And it says we were not given a score for this group. And then another question states that they're a small district and they have no English learners. Do we need a goal? So Neil referenced the plan and whether or not you have English learners, you need to have a plan in place because you never know, you know, when you may have some enter your district. In terms of the goal, if you have any English learners, you really should have a goal in there. But even though you have a small number, because that indicator is based on progress, you can set a general goal without identifying specific students or without mentioning where they're at currently. So you might say um, for an objective for this year that every EL student will increase 0.5 levels this school year. And so that sets a goal for whether you have one or 10 or 100 
um, EEL students and it's not going to identify any of them and it's not going to tell where they're at right now, but you want them to grow at least half a level this particular school year. So hopefully that answers that one. Uh, let me see what other questions we have here in the chat. Um, I wish. OK, Krista asked, is there an option to archive past CDIPs and CSIPs? We are um, we continue to ask Cognia for that option for a lot of you, even the smaller districts at, at this point, there's so many years worth of diagnostics in there. We know it makes it difficult to navigate through there. Um, it's difficult sometimes to even search um, because you have to wait for all of them to load. So we continue to ask for that. It hasn't been uh, made available yet, but um, know that that's on our radar as well. And, and we'll continue to advocate for that. Um, I see one, since there are new required goals for CSIP and CDIP, and the districts were given four goal setting options to choose from last year, can all goals be rewritten starting with 21-22 data? Yes, absolutely. Um, we know that a lot of you relied on um, local data during COVID when you didn't have state assessment data, and um, we definitely want you to to continue using that data when you look at your needs. But now that you do have that 2122 state assessment data, you can certainly um, start fresh with your goals. And you know those would be goals then for 2025 to 2028, depending on how far out you're going three to five years. But yes, you can definitely start over with those goals. Um, another question, will we receive a copy of the presentation to share with an additional invitation uh, individuals? Yes, you should have gotten um, a copy of the PowerPoint um, when I sent the link for this. If you did not, shoot me an email and I'll, and I'll send it to you, but we will also be um, posting both the recording and um, the PowerPoint on the Comprehensive Improvement Planning webpage. Um, I see a question here with the state goals posted on the school report card. Are we required to use the goal provided by the state or can we adjust the goal number? Yeah, those goals are the state's goals and they are not required for schools or districts. It is a good idea to kind of look at them and see what that state level goal is, but you are writing your goal according to where you're at right now and where you want to see yourself at the end of this year and at the end of the next three to five years. So definitely be aware of those. Think about where you're at in reference to them, but those are the state goals and they're not something that's required by a school or district. Let's see another question. Would you explain the superintendent gap assurance? Yeah, and this I've gotten several questions about this. So the last few years, because we did not have state assessment data, we asked you to use old data. Basically, you were looking at 2017-18 and 2018-19 data uh, to determine who met their goals or not. Because we had state assessment data and because we've used that for multiple years now, we really do want you using um, the 2021 data and the 2122 data as it is. We know, especially with 2021, some of you don't have a lot of it, but to the best, the best of your ability, determine which schools met the goals that they set for themselves. We talked about earlier that during COVID, some people used um, data other than state assessment scores. So you may have had a school who wrote their achievement gap goal using local data. So you can then look at that local data and determine if they met that goal or not. Or you may have some schools that um, did set their, their goal on state assessment data. We know that the indicators were new. We know that test scores didn't necessarily um, come back the way maybe they have in years past, but we we are required to just report whether or not the schools you know met the goals that they set for themselves. Hope that answered that question. Um, another question: What about goals for the quality of school climate and safety? Um, and we're looking to get a little bit more information about that from, um, in our office as well. 
um, but really you're just looking at um, you know the overall score scores that you were given are there particular areas within there that were lower than some other areas um, and you can write a goal towards increasing um, the responses in some of those areas. Are there other questions from folks that didn't get a chance to put them in the chat or would just like to unmute and ask those? And definitely feel free to contact anyone that you heard today um, about any of the, the sections that they may have talked about. Um, just a few resources that we do have available. There is a, a guidance page um, for the superintendent gap assurance on our web page. Um, there's the user manual for the continuous improvement platform that Marsha mentioned. We do have other resources on our web page. And then this last one is just a uh, an article from Cognia about continuous improvement in general in that process. So as you leave here today, I hope you've learned some new things or clarified some things for yourself. And I hope that you kind of think about how the individual diagnostics can really build upon each other to provide a more informed and developed CSIP or CDIP. And then um, hopefully you're thinking about how you're going to use some of the information that you learned today to improve the processes and the diagnostics at your own school or district. So again, I wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, special thanks to our presenters for today. And please let us know if you have questions as you're moving forward. Thank you and have a great afternoon.